There we go again at Exodus chapter 32, verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people has sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Uh, no, some sins are definitely worse than others, and idolatry, which comes in many forms, is one of the worst of all, which is recorded in John chapter 19, verse 11. Uh, in other words, God's going to punish you for saying a bad or a nasty word to someone, but he's going to punish you a lot worse if you take a machine gun and go out and kill people. I mean, obviously, I mean, come on. Some sins are definitely going to be punished harder and quicker than others. Verse 32. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray you, out of your book which you have written. Mm, wow, that's notes. This is the first mention of the book of life found in the Bible. God could only forgive the sins of those who asked for such forgiveness recorded in John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, I should say. There is a difference there. There's actually four books of John. Verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Notes, uh, Moses descended from on high with the law, confronted with man's sins, and he broke, the, uh, he, he broke both tables, then returned with a cheerless pre-adventure on his lips to seek an uncertain forgiveness. And he failed. Christ descended from on high, fulfilled the law, and having on behalf of sinners, uh, he suffered its full penalty. And he returned to heaven having shed his precious blood, the sign of his accomplished atonement, and he obtained an absolutely certain forgiveness. Verse 34. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Uh, notes. It is... It has been argued and even conjectured that this angel is different from the angel of Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. Well, it is my thought that this is the same angel. It seems as though the Lord had threatened to remove this angel, who in essence was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, but now consents that he may remain with Israel, thereby continuing to lead and to watch over them. Uh, it's just really just a matter of personal opinion. Verse 35. And the Lord plagued the people uh, because they made the calf which Aaron made. Notes. Uh, the word plagued here means to push, defeat, inflict disease, kill, smite, and put to the worst. And now exactly what the Lord did, we are not told. It seems to be in the form of some kind of chastisement and seems somewhat, as the next chapter proclaims, to have had at least some positive effect. And we're continuing in chapter 33. Uh, and I got a little bit of a runny nose. I apologize for that. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, you and the people, turning the page, which you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto your seed will I give it. Uh, notes. Uh, the host, according to the command of the Lord, will now start toward the promised land. However, the unbelief which brought about the golden calf would also shut the door to the entrance of the promised land. That generation would die in the wilderness and take 38 years to do so, uh, so their sin delayed the plan of God as all sin delays the plan of God. Once again, I believe it has been effectively stated it took 40 minutes to get uh, Israel out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And the golden calf, as I stated, was worshipped throughout Egypt. I mean, all you have to do is just look at their culture, and they worshipped many animals. They worshipped goats, frogs, and they even worshipped cabbages, if you can even imagine that. Verse 2. <laughs> Ridiculous. But anyways, verse 2. And I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Uh, notes. The Lord never said that the promised land would be free of enemies. 
but he does promise victory over those enemies. Uh, regrettably, Israel, as we will later see, did not believe him. Uh, verse 3. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of you, for you are a stiff-necked people, lest I consume you in the way. Notes. To have the presence of the Lord is the greatest thing in the world, unless the believer decides on a wrong direction. Uh, that being the case, that present which is meant to bless will instead destroy. Uh, you think the devil is your worst enemy? Make God angry at you. And unfortunately... <laughs> That's what happened. Verse 4. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man p did put on his ornaments. Uh, notes. Due to the greatness of their sin, the Lord wanted them to know that this was no time for festivities, levity, or decorations. In other words, they must take this matter very, very seriously. Verse 5. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of you in a moment and consume you. Therefore now put off your ornaments from yourselves, that I may know what to do unto you. Notes. In essence, the Lord was telling the children of Israel that what Pharaoh could not do, he would do in a moment. Verse 6. <laughs> Now, this is a, well, notes, this is a very serious threat. And God means what he says. And we'll, we'll continue with verse 6. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Uh, no, it's the Hebrew word used here is ohel, ohel, which means tent, and should have been translated accordingly. The Hebrew word for tabernacle is mishkan, which was not used here. Uh, Moses moved his own tent outside the camp because the main tabernacle had not yet been built. Verse eight, and it came to pass when Moses went under the tabernacle, uh, notes tent that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. Notes, the Lord telling Moses to take his tent outside of the camp was really an act of grace. Had it remained in the camp, judgment may very well have fallen on the people. Verse 9, And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended, and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Uh, notes. Uh, the cloudy pillar denoted the presence of God. Verse 10. And the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Notes. But yet the worship is going to prove to be very, very shallow, more out of fear than anything else, unfortunately. Verse 11, And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. Uh, notes, that doesn't mean that they were looking each other eye to eye two feet away. It means that they were talking very, very intimately. Scripture, And Moses turned again unto the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Notes, uh, one day Joshua would take the place of Moses, even though it would be many years into the future. But the Holy Spirit had already begun his training, showing the preparation time that was needed. And we'll have to pick up in Exodus chapter 33, verse 12. Thank you, thank you, thank you.